We're going to talk about mood disorders in children and adolescents. Why separating children and adolescents from adults? As you know, we have the DSM-4 TR, which is the revised. That's our, that's our Bible, supposedly is what we call our Bible. Well, it's really the adult Bible. It's not the kid and adolescent Bible. A lot of the characteristics that are described, a lot of the criteria to be able to diagnose bipolar disorder, even depression, or many of the other conditions, the criteria are for adult, and they're the adult studies, not for kids necessarily. And so when we see kids and adults in our office, they don't fit all the criteria, and therefore we use a lot of the NOSs, the not other, uh, otherwise specified, which means it's not fitting the criteria for the DSM-4, but we know it's in that realm of that diagnosis. And we'll talk about the big differences between children and adolescents and the adults as well uh, today giving it obviously more importance to children and adolescents. So these are going to be the objectives. I won't go through them. They were in the, you know, the, in the, in the invitation. Uh, but basically, we will go through the mood disorders um, with an emphasis on depression and an emphasis on bipolar disorder. Uh, and you will be able to, at the end, be able to kind of define these, understand what the criteria are, and the treatment, as well as some of the differential diagnosis. Mood. We think that the word is so easily understood, and we all know, what is your mood today? And all of you can say, well, my mood is this or it's that. Ask a child that's four years old, what's your mood? And they will look at you and say, what? So we can say, mood is the way a person feels inside, the experience of emotion sustained and predominant internal emotional experience, all very nice and poetic and all that kind of stuff. Still, a five-year-old doesn't know what mood is. Part of the difficulties we have as child and adolescent psychiatrists and therapists, counselors of smaller kids, is they don't have the, uh, the established uh, vocabulary. Right? Even the adolescents don't have the established vocabulary. As they start treatment, they're going to learn the words. They learn it from us because we start asking them, what is your mood? How do you feel? They'll go, well, I feel, you know, at the beginning they'll say, I feel kind of hyper. And then we're going, no, 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 I don't mean by, you know, are you hyper or not? I mean, what do you feel? And, and then you start explaining to them the feeling is that emotion of sadness, happiness, anger. You start by little happy faces, sad, sad faces. So it's very important when we're studying mood disorders that we understand this because a lot of people just say, okay. And what does okay even mean, right? Teenagers will say, well, how do you feel? Well, I feel kind of neutral. Well, what does even neutral mean? Well, neutral is actually happy because it's not sad. Right? But you have to look into those things because happiness to a lot of people means you're going to be giddy and laughing, ha, 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 kind of thing. That's not really what we're, we're expecting. And especially in adolescents, we don't expect happiness to be the giddiness. And, all, and that could be elatedness for all we know, right? So we have to go into those details to try to teach the individuals and the parents also to be able to give appropriate observations and, and uh, assessments of the mood of the children. Okay, A child that hits isn't necessarily sad. A child that hits isn't necessarily angry. They could be very happy. It depends on why they're hitting, right? What's behind the purpose of the aggression. So again, we need to look for that. Now, mood is something that is reported by the individual, right? Which is very different than, or not very different, it's different than affect. Affect is what we are observing what we think by our observations the person's mood is. So a person can say they're very happy. Or actually, it's what we see more often in, in psychotic individuals is they are aggressive, they say they're angry, but then they're smiling at the same time. Right? So they say their mood is angry. They say that um, they're irritable. Uh, and this, we're talking about teenagers, but then their affect shows something different. So it's inappropriate affect. These observations are very important also. You might have teenagers, and we'll talk about a, a case that just came recently, where the person is hearing voices saying that they want to, the voices are telling them to kill themselves. Um, they have self-injurious behavior. They're extremely high functioning, which means great grades, do very well with their peers, and they're telling me all this with a smile on their face. And I'm thinking, well, if you're so sad and you want to hurt yourself, why do you have a smile on your face? I'm obviously thinking that, not saying it. 
And so that's incongruent affect. And you look into it a little bit further, and you find out that actually all those negative things are not appropriate feelings for that person to have, so they don't know how to express them. And so that's something that we have to see also in the assessment of the individual. OK. So what is a mood disorder? Basically, it's a disturbance of the mood that we just talked about that actually affects functioning. So just because you're in a bad mood, you don't have a mood disorder. Okay? If you're a parent and you're ticked off because your kid hasn't done what they're supposed to do, right, and you get angry, but you were happy in the morning, it doesn't mean you're bipolar, okay? <laughs> even though they think you are. And I say that based on a personal experience I just had a week ago. I was diagnosed, diagnosed bipolar last week. Now I'm just dysthymic, which means a chronic, depressed mood the whole time, right? Because they've grounded, so I have to keep that mood. OK, then we have the types of mood disorder. Uh, the types of mood disorder, major depressive disorder. Uh, we will talk about the criteria. That's the one that we're going to kind of stick to the most. The thymic disorder, which is basically a chronic depressed mood. Depressive disorder, NOS, which means it didn't fit the criteria for major depressive disorder or dysthymic disorder. They're depressed. It's not normal emotion, but it's in there somewhere. Okay. Bipolar disorder, we have 1, 2, and NOS, which you will see that that will change, that will change when we talk about kids and adolescents. Okay? Because the, the criteria for 1 and 2 really don't fit for kids and adolescents. Now, you can have bipolar 1 in children and adolescents, but it is very rare to see the pure form, the form that fits the criteria just like adults. We have mood disorder, NOS. Well, mood disorder NOS is what we use the most. Mood disorder NOS means for us in general that we think they might have bipolar disorder, but we're not sure, OK? We, that they, that the, ch the child or adolescent seems to have a lot of the criteria of bipolar disorder, but we're not sure yet because they don't fit the full criteria to be able to give that diagnosis. And we suspect there might be other things going on. When we talk about the differential diagnosis, you will see that there are other situations or other conditions that mimic bipolar disorder, right? A depressed hyper, in other words, a child with major depressive disorder that has severe ADHD will look like they're bipolar, right? And what do we diagnose? Mood disorder. Maybe it's the first time we've ever seen them. Now, if we know them well enough, we can differentiate that, right? But to know someone, you can't do that in the first hour or two hours of assessment. You have an idea, but you don't have all the information you need to clearly diagnose. Okay. And then substance-induced mood disorders and general medical conditions. We will talk about those briefly as well. Question? How long should, should one carry with your There's no... It's not how long the individual should carry it, how long the, the uh, physician takes until you're completely sure, yes. Because giving a child a diagnosis of bipolar disorder is a big deal, yeah. right? Not only that, we're, we're treating the individual in such a way, right? If we, if we say bipolar disorder, then, then we're already saying we're sure this is the way we need to treat kind of thing. So, and then the other part is, a lot of child and adolescent psychiatrists we would like to treat symptoms, not a diagnosis, OK? When we say bipolar disorder, then we're committing to a diagnosis and a specific treatment. But childhood is such a, such a fluid situation right? that the symptoms that are important this month aren't necessarily the symptoms that are important next month. So I think that we should, we should treat is according to the symptoms and the need of the child in that moment not the diagnosis. Okay. It's a little bit different with adults because adults, there is more stability. Stability, emotional, and I'm not talking about mood stability. I'm talking about they already have a pattern of behaviors that they have established. And so it's easier to predict what's going to happen next. Not with kids. You're still, you know, the hormones start kicking, kicking in in puberty. That kind of messes up the picture, right? Um, the breakups, that's a different story. Transitions from elementary school to middle school, middle school to high school. There's just so many incredible transitions. And the fact that our brain isn't formed yet, right? So that's still in, the, in process. Um, 
a lot of different things that can that can that can change, and that can change the importance of the symptom, the predominant symptom. Okay. Uh, okay, major depressive disorder. So, kind of some of the numbers: one percent in preschool kids. Okay, of major of major depressive disorder. Again, diagnose major depressive disorder. Okay. And I'm not going through all the criteria for depression and bipolar disorder just because it takes so much time. Okay. Um, then we have 2% in school age kids, 4 to 8% in adolescents. But by the time a person is 18 years old, group of 18 year olds, 20% of those individuals have had a, depressive, a major depressive episode, which does not mean major depressive disorder completely, but a, depress a depressive episode. Now, why these numbers? Why so low in preschool and in school age kids? Maybe because it's just so difficult to diagnose and parents just kind of deal with it, right? They, they really don't come into the office. They don't necessarily become part of research studies. Uh, parents don't like to give up their five-year-old for research, right? Test meds in this person or, you know, and a five-year-old can be highly anxious and maybe look depressed when they're over there at, you know, UT and they're not depressed when they're at home. So very, very susceptible to the environment. 25 to 50% of the kids that come into our outpatient office or inpatient come in because they have some form of depression. Okay. So, and the ratio before the age of 10, this is interesting because it shifts. The ratio before the age of 10 is 5 to 1 males, right? And uh, afterwards, or in adolescence, it's 1 to 2 where the females have more, the girls have more, uh, are diagnosed with depression more. Okay. Why? Maybe because there is more comorbidity with, in the, in the youngers, the younger ones. With ADHD, they're identified, hyperactivity as opposed to inattentiveness. There's, there's some comorbidity, so maybe the boys stand out more. There's more disruptive behavior in the boy population at that age, and so the depression can be identified. Is it biological? It might be also biological because as we, as we talk a little bit more, we will see that early onset depression might not be major depressive disorder. It might be the first episode of depression of bipolar disorder, right? So the earlier onset, and I will repeat this many times, but the earlier the onset of depression in a person's life, the higher the risk of it presenting as bipolar disorder later on in life. Very important when you're talking about uh, kids in elementary school. And also treatment. Okay, clinical presentation in general, without going through too much of the criteria. Depressed mood or irritability uh, consistently, so not only when you get in trouble, but just consistently, for at least a two-week period. The two-week period is very important. If, um, if it's less than two weeks, you know, kids can get depressed for many things. They got a bad grade, their dog died, that kind of thing. So, um, and it could be shorter for two weeks, it could be longer. We have to separate it from bereavement also, right, and grieving. So it depends on what's going on in the environment. But it must be different than the usual mood of the individual, right? And it also should impair functioning. Now, that's the criteria, that's an important criteria for any of the, to put disorder on anything. Right? Disorder is it has to impede functioning. You can be depressed for two weeks, but not necessarily impede your functioning. You can function, the child can function socially, they can function at school, so academically, they can still get along with their peers, but they're sad. They're sad because, again, you know, their puppy died. But they can still concentrate and function and interact in all the milieus. Yes, ma'am? Um, is this, I guess this is based on not the new DSM, right? Is this, this is based on what? Is this based on the newest DSM? Or? Well, the newest DSM is going to come out. It's the DSM-5. Okay, but so this is, it's not going to, nothing's going to change? Or we, you know, we don't know yet. They're still in progress. You're talking about that, um, having to, like, affect their environment? Yes. Sometimes that can be a little bit restrictive because it may be leading in that direction. But if we don't catch people soon enough, then it could start to affect their, you know, well, we're, when we're talking about diagnosing something, we're not saying don't treat it, right? Which is, a, and that's kind of my point at the beginning is just because we're not, we're saying it's a mood disorder does not mean we're not going to treat the symptoms, right? 
Um, and just be, because we don't want to, we don't want to wait, exactly. But we need to establish when to treat also. Right? And we'll talk about in, a little bit further down about therapy versus medications, that kind of thing. But functioning is very important to be able to say it's a disorder. Maybe you don't want to jump to treat people just because it's kind of going that way, but we're not sure if it got there. Because maybe just the therapeutic, the psychotherapy interventions are going to be enough without medication. OK. We're going to talk a little bit about differences between kids and adolescents and how they present. Right. So depression in adults, very quickly, usually. They're sad, boo -hoo -hoo, they cry, they say, I'm sad. Um, they don't, they isolate, they don't want to interact with other people. They can say all this. They describe it perfectly, right? There's very few adults that get sad and say, I don't know what's happening to me, right? I don't know what I'm feeling. No, no, they know what they're feeling. They know what's happening and they're functioning, so it's very clear. But with kids, it isn't. Um, with kids, they have, with smaller children, and we usually talk about children under 11, 10, and then adolescents, we, we kind of include the 11, 12 as adolescents now. Um, but a negative self-image. So you're going to hear them say, I'm bad, I'm a bad boy, I'm a bad girl, I'm ugly. All those negative self-comments. Very concrete. So what do they describe? They describe their image. right? They don't, they don't say, I'm a person of poor character and principles. Right? Yeah, they say, I'm fat, I'm ugly, I don't write nicely. It's that kind of stuff. Uh, somatic complaints. Again, they don't know to say, I'm unhappy, uh, I'm angry. So they start complaining about, you know, my tummy hurts. You know, is that anxiety? Is that depression? My muscles hurt. My body hurts. Uh, I want to stay in bed. I feel like I have a cold, or I feel like I'm getting sick. So a lot of somatic complaints, social withdrawal. Now we're looking at the kiddo and isolation that really doesn't want to play with other kids. They've passed the parallel playing. You know, at a certain age, they parallel play. They want to play in the same area, but they don't want to play with each other, right? And then they get to the point where they do want to play games with each other, right? So what is it called? Uh, shoots and ladders and all the board games, that kind of stuff. Um, they don't want to do that anymore. Now remember, we're always comparing functioning before the episode and functioning during the episode. So we're talking about a kiddo that did not have any social withdrawal, and now you're noticing that they don't want to interact. okay? Or they interact in an aggressive way because they want to push people away. Not because they go and attack, but if anyone gets close to them, they push them away. Social withdrawal in children. Behavioral problems with anger outbursts. They just can't tolerate anything, so they have a major fit, temper tantrum. Right? Isolation, again, they're kind of on their own. They really don't want to interact with anyone. Rejection sensitivity is very important. Uh, rejection sensitivity is basically where they feel that um, if the, there are two teams, two basketball teams, they're already playing, and they go, I want to play, I want to play, and they say, no, you're going to have to wait because we already have the full teams formed. They don't like me. They hate me. They're not going to let me play. It's all, you know, they feel rejected, even in situations where it's not true rejection, right? Um, and so, and this is constant. Like, there's a seat open, and someone is saying it. They take it personally. They don't want me to sit by them, as opposed to, yeah, they were just safe kind of situation. So that's rejection sensitivity. That happens in adults also as well.